Okay, hi everybody, thanks for joining us. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Peter Llewellyn. Uh, I run the services at medcomsnetworking.com, which is uh, an array of services, uh, re information resources, activities and so on for the global medcoms uh, community, by which I'm talking about people who work in and around uh, medical communications, medical education, medical publishing. Um, and um, one of the things we do um, and, uh, is over at firstmedcomsjob.com is we provide information resources for people who want to come and join the Medcoms business. Um, these webinars um, are a great way of involving more people um, to talk about specialist interest areas. And what we're doing today is we're going to be talking about uh, working in HUR market access writing. Uh, delighted to have Linda Harrison with us, who's the author of our careers guide. Um, we've recently just published the updated a new issue, uh, updated the issue um, in June, which you'll find over at firstmedcomsjob.com. Um, so Linda's the author, and Manka and Amy are two of the people who put profiles into that. Um, into that publication. So we thought today we'd just get together and, and chat about what life is like in, in Market Access HUR. Um, so thanks very much for guys for joining me. Um, I'm going to hand over to Linda to paint the picture and introduce herself. Um, so over to you, Linda. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. Um, so I'm Linda Harrison. I'm a freelance market access consultant and a medical writer. I provide services directly to pharmaceutical companies, but also to market access and health economic consultancies. I set up my business, my freelance business in 2014. And prior to doing that, I worked for a large market access and health economic consultancy for around 14 years. How are we doing, Peter? Is that sounding okay? That's absolutely fine. Let's just keep going, yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I started at the very bottom of the tree um, in market access and health economics um, over 20 years ago and started as a trainee and then I worked myself through the business, really through the project management route um, and did lots of training on the job and eventually ended up as um, health technology assessment director just prior to leaving the consultancy around six years ago. Um, before Manka and Amy introduce themselves, um, I'm just going to spend a few minutes to explain what we mean by market access and health economics. It might be new terminology for, for people that are listening in. So what we mean by market access is really that patients who are el eligible for treatments um, receive those drugs in a rapid and continuous manner at a cost that is acceptable to the healthcare system in a given country. Um, millions and more often billions are spent on uh, developing and gaining marketing, marketing authorization for a new drug. But actually the book doesn't stop there once market, marketing authorization is received because in order for patients to benefit from new treatments and for companies to get the massive return on investment that they've, they've been involved already, it's critical that new drugs are funded for use at both a local and a national level. Um, and that's what we mean, i.e. market access is achieved. And in order to achieve successful market access, the manufacturer needs to demonstrate the added clinical value and the economic value of a given technology versus existing drugs that are already on the market. Health economic evaluation, as a side for market access, allows a comparative analysis of all the costs and all the benefits of one drug versus another drug that's already on the market to demonstrate value for money. And we often use mathematical models to develop um, the, and to demonstrate the cost effectiveness of a new drug. Market access and health economic, health economic agencies generate evidence and then help the pharma companies then to communicate the evidence required to demonstrate the added value of a technology. Um, some project deliverables, as an example, may be health economic models, development of a global value dossier, development of a value message story, systematic literature reviews, and health technology assessments as examples. Some agencies um, offer only market access services, whilst others offer just health economic services, with many working across both disciplines. Um, so I hope that just sort of sets the scene a little bit around market access and health economics. And I'll hand it back over to um, Amy and Manka to introduce themselves. Brilliant, thanks. Um, and we're going to start with Manka, if, if that's OK. Can you um, talk a little bit yeah. about yourself and how you got into the business and what you're doing? Yeah, definitely. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Vansa. I am currently a market access consultant in uh, Amicum Access, which is our market access agency. 
Um, I worked for Amiculum for um, just under a year. I started in August last year. Um, and my main role really is to um, work very closely with our agency lead to make sure that we're um, running our access agency um, the way we should. So um, we actually just launched um, the access agency in uh, May, which sounds like it should be about five years ago, but it's actually only a couple of months. Um, so it's a very new agency. So um, as you can imagine, a lot of um, the day to day is um, a lot of BD, a lot of commercial um, engagement with our clients um, and on the other side also um, sort of project leading and then um, taking care of all of our writers that we have um, on our project. Um, in terms of uh, my previous work I also have uh, four uh, additional years of experience in other consultancies. Um, like Linda I started from the bottom so I started as a writer and then worked my way up to a uh, senior writer and then um, consultant. Um, but prior to that, um, I actually um, started um, in a very sort of research-based um, way. Um, I did a PhD um, in biotechnology and protein engineering, so very much miles away from what I'm doing now. Um, but um, based on sort of those four years, I've really, um, really uh, learned that uh, research wasn't that much for me. Um, so I, I really just wanted to go into an area that was a little bit more applicable, a little bit more um, meaningful to me and um, sort of stumbled into market access as a, pro as, um, as a part of that. Um, so I know you wanted me to also um, briefly talk about um, Amiculum, so where I work currently. Um, so um, Amiculum is a family of nine agencies. Um, that specialize in different parts of uh, medcoms. So on top of market access, we also have um, an events team, we have a publications team, um, specialized rare diseases and a genetic medicine team. Um, and we are very much sort of a cross agency uh, collaboration, um, if you will. So our clients come to us with a problem and we uh, tend to use um, organizational agility, which we like to call it, um, to basically pick experts from different teams to fit the project or fit the, the problem that the client has. Um, so one day I could be working on a purely market access project. The other day we could be working with our design team and our digital team on web pages or maybe with our learning team on training. Um, so it's a really sort of broad spectrum of uh, work that we do. Um, so you might notice that my um, title or my job title is quite vague, um, which is sort of a deliberate thing. Um, at Amiculum we do have a job title free environment, so um, that really sort of focuses us on a colleague-led um, work rather than a title-led work. Um, and it also sort of nods to the fact that we do a lot of work that might not necessarily fit sort of one role or the other because we do work in that sort of cross-agency collaboration space. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit about me. Um, moving on, Amy. Excellent, that's fantastic. Amy, can we hear what your little story is? Yes, of course. Um, so hi everyone, I'm Amy. So I'm a value analyst at Adelphi Valleys Prove, um, which is a global healthcare consultancy um, supporting market access. So uh, Prove sits within a group, the Adelphi group, which specialise in a variety of um, communications and evidence generation aspects. Um, so Prove itself, uh, we specialise in a variety of sort of um, diverse deliverables that we work with our clients with um, in terms of sort of all aspects of market access throughout their kind of commercialization process of their healthcare product and as Linda was saying really just bringing that product to the market and looking into how they can really highlight that value um, throughout different sort of deliverables and to different stakeholders across different markets. Um, in terms of how I started working I studied biomedical sciences at Manchester and um, lots of their analysts and different members um, of the team at Prove studied life sciences um, and when I finished here I knew I kind of didn't want to work in labs and I think like a lot of life sciences graduates wasn't fully really aware of the different opportunities available and um, I was involved in a variety of science communication sort of projects with places like Manchester Museum and the Royal Society and things um, but I think from this I really knew I wasn't learning almost enough sort of new information and having the opportunity to sort of get involved with the, that more sort of business side of the pharma industry and healthcare um, 
which as Manga said kind of just stumbled across market access um, and yeah applied at Prove and started working here last year. Um, in terms of like day to day as an analyst um, I think that really encompasses a lot of different sort of roles so I'm going from things like obviously analysing data um, and working with the whole project team then to develop various different deliverables um, so lots of medical writing of more say technical documents and um, all the way through to more sort of innovative um, projects maybe doing infographics or developing really visual slides to, to um, emphasize that value with yeah just again that whole story with the value story and kind of looking at that strategy and how we can really help our clients to sort of highlight that value throughout all the work that we do at Delphi. Thank you. Um, can I just specifically, and I'll um, also go Amy Manka, just, just go a little bit beyond what you said about the companies themselves. So in terms of, and I don't know in terms of the audience that are watching this, but uh, we will have people based outside the UK and so on. So can you just, just touch on, um, you know, where are you based around the world? Because you both have got offices around the world, yeah? So Amy, can you just, just briefly touch on the, on the bigger international picture there? You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure. um, so I personally am based uh, just out of Manchester. We also have a London office um, and we also have various offices um, around the globe, uh, including in the US um, and other markets as well. There, so um, while we might not always be working continually with on individual projects with different members, from different sort of uh, markets of, of a from Adelphi. Um, we've obviously got that insight that is obviously really valuable when we're working with clients um, from a higher level, so they can really draw that expertise in from different markets if, if that's required. Okay, so you, um, and Manka, just again, just touch on where are the, where are the offices around the world? Yeah, um, so we have um, 18 office locations around the world um, in, uh, I believe, eight countries, don't quote me on that. So um, our biggest, um, offices are here in London and in Manchester, uh, but we also have offices in the US. Um, in Asia, we have quite a big presence in both Singapore and China. Um, we have a Dubai office as well and a uh, office in New Zealand. So we are actually fully online 24 hours a day, um, which um, obviously is a great help to our clients um, when they need support from us um, at any, in any sort of time zone. Um, but it, again, as Amy said, also allows us to sort of bring in local expertise when we're talking about Asian market access or European or US. Okay, excellent. I just wanted to get a bit of a sense of that sort of international spectrum. Um, however, I mean, you know, without being silly about it, this, today is about talking to you guys about what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So, um, so let's think a little bit about that. And let's, let's just address up front the basic context of, of what, we're, what we're doing today. Um, you know, we will be in lockdown for a few weeks, um, starting to become quite a number of weeks. Um, uh, but let me just again run, if I can just run around, Linda, I'm going to start with you. You're a freelancer going through the lockdown. Just give us a sense of how things have been and um, uh, yeah, just, just give us a sense of how things have, uh, yeah. has anything changed for you? I suppose nothing's really changed for you. Not really. Um, I'm in the lucky position that I'm a freelancer and I work generally from home anyway with very little need to travel to meetings. It's all done via webinar or Zoom meetings or whatever these days, a conference call. So life hasn't really changed for me so much in lockdown um and the work continues to come in which is great so um yeah little change for me really excellent so so man i'm gonna go in this order again just for a moment but um you're obviously at home uh, you know how have you found it um yes i've been at home for four four or five months now four or five months yeah um <laughs> Yeah, so we were um, quite fortunate at Mickle and we have a really strong remote working culture. And so um, we've had those systems in place prior to um, sort of the pandemic. Um, and we have two offices in China, actually. So they were the first ones to go into lockdown and they really pressure tested all our systems to make sure that when pretty much everyone um, that works for, uh, for Mickle went uh, online then, um, that we were sort of well prepared. Um, so yeah, it was fairly seamless for us. Um, as, as Linda said, nothing really has changed. All our work is online, our clients are online. Um, and we, we've been really lucky to sort of have those systems in place and not really been able, uh, we didn't have to sort of furlough anyone. We kept working and in fact, we kept um, growing through that epidemic, which I think is probably the case for a lot of medcoms agencies. Yeah, because a lot, a lot are busy. Uh, Amy, would you back up that? How are you getting on at home? 
Yeah, definitely. Um, as Menke was saying, so much of the work um, we have is online and we're working with clients all over the world. So you're naturally, you're never going to be in the same room as them anyway. So it, you, we work really effectively from home. Um, I think just the biggest thing is not being able to be with the team, which makes up such a big part of, of my like work life. But being able to work effectively, sort of obviously virtual conferences and things works well to kind of carry on with those projects and make sure nothing's taking a hit just because of working from home. Yeah, yeah. But generally, generally the business is doing quite well at the moment in terms of work coming in um, and people are adapting quite well. And indeed, as, as a couple of you said, I mean, we've been fairly um, far down the pathway of people working flexibly anyway. So I guess in some ways um, it's not been such a big problem as, as in other businesses. Um, OK, so look, that was that was really interesting just to hear a little bit of a picture of, of where you guys are and where you've come from. Um, so just a quick reminder to the audience, um, we're very keen to get your questions and comments and observations as it were by either of the two text boxes the chat box or the q a box so please do text in those questions and we'll feed that into the conversation okay and um, what i'd like to do is, is perhaps just start with just a sort of the basic obvious question i suppose um we're, we're sort of talking writing um and and we've got different job titles and so on um but let's just think about the the, the context here again so both manka amy you both said you're you're in specialist divisions effectively within bigger communications groups and linda was talking about how some companies specialize very much in market access some like yours have special divisions others maybe there's a market access person or team or whatever um, or it's part of what they do what i'm interested in is trying to understand what makes a market access hur writer as opposed to a more general medcoms writer or isn't there a difference? Is it just, you know, so, so again, each of you, and I'm gonna go backwards, can I go backwards this time? But just give me a sense of what you feel is, is maybe slightly different, if there is any difference about market access, HUR medical writing, as opposed to the more general context that some of your colleagues are working in. Can you do that? And I'm gonna go back with Amy, if that's okay with you. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, as you were saying, my title is obviously an analyst, um, which I think might be a little bit confusing if you're not aware of what the role is, but um, that does really encompass the medical writing. And I think from my terms of uh, my point of view, um, it being market access, you're just, it's all about having that sort of bigger picture of what's going on in the market and being able to use that insight to and communicate that in the writing in the pieces that we're developing um, for our clients. So I suppose just bringing through that insight and making sure that we're highlighting exactly where that particular healthcare product might fit in the various systems across the globe and making sure that's being highlighted in the writing that we do. Um, so it's very obviously um, specified to the particular market, say, that we're working with. Um, and said product and, and what kind of point they're on in terms of launching their product or the different commercialization. So making sure that the writing that we're doing is really sort of targeted and tailored to those audiences. Um, Do you think there's anything know. different about you as a market access HUR writer analyst as opposed to a more general medical communications writer? Or do you not see it in those terms? I mean, I'm, I'm trying to ask stupid questions here, um, just try to get a, a sense of... Yeah, I caught me a little bit off guard. I'm not, I'm not really sure in terms of what the specific role of just a medical writer would be. I'm not sure if, Manka, you a bit more able to answer that question. Okay, no, it's, and, and don't worry about this. If we can't answer the questions, I'm just trying to get a sense of, of maybe where the differences are. Because you came, Amy, you came into market access, didn't you? So specifically, yeah, yeah? but you're, you've yeah. got people around you do more generally. Manka, again, same sort of question. I mean, do you... Do you see a difference between what you're doing as an HR market access writer as opposed to some of your colleagues or not? So there are differences. I would say at the baseline, so at an entry level, the differences aren't really that, that massive. So you need to be a good medical writer to be a good market access writer. Um, however, as you uh, sort of progress to sort of senior writer or maybe more commercial roles, um, you definitely need to be thinking about that bigger picture, like Amy said. So um, the example I like to give is, um, I don't know how many actual medical writers we have in the audience, but um, we do a lot of similar projects um, to what medical writers do. Um, so we might be doing the same kind of deliverables. So for instance, a value dossier where we put in all of the data for um, the drug um, that's, that's out there. Um, we might be writing the same thing as a medical writer would be writing, but what we're doing is we're thinking about, okay, what is the story? What is the strategy that we're trying to um, convey? What is the client trying to say with this drug? And we're pulling that through and making sure that there's a value story that we're following. And then we're making sure that we're working with um, the global team and the affiliate teams to make sure that that 
piece of work is being utilized correctly in those discussions in the markets to make sure that the pricing and the access is there. So I think it's like, it's medical writer plus, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Linda, have you got a view on that? And what is it, when you, if you're looking at people who might be wanting to come into this business, are they gonna have particular strengths and you go, right, you're the sort of person that would be better suited to market access? Yeah, I think, I think in, terms of, of, in terms of writing itself, um, from a market access and health economic point of view, obviously you're involved, if you're in that agency, in, in, in writing up technical health economic models or publications and posters around health economics. So it can be quite technical from that perspective, or you're writing up health technology assessments um, for NICE or for SMC or other HGA bodies. So that, that aspect of it is, is quite technical. But there's also, I think, a very creative side. Um, so I think, I, I think from my perspective, I would say um, market access writing and HEOR writing um, allows for a little bit more flexibility in terms of creativity. So more, you think, so more flexibility? Yeah, I think it just it gives you a, a little bit of um, uh, more of a passion to, to pull out those key value messages and, and, and value messages in terms of economics and clinical for a product to, to, to help it gain market access. And, and therefore you do have to be slightly more creative minded, uh, but bearing in mind that those messages still need to be evidence-based. Okay, just out of interest, when you're talking about things like the dossiers and so on, I suppose when you hear the word dossier, I sort of think of something big, big, technical, cumbersome sort of thing. Um, are, a lot of your projects, are they, are they big and, 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 and technical like that? Um, as opposed to maybe, I mean, if you're in more medcoms work, might be, you know, um, might be more bits and pieces, if I can put it like that. Um, it might be, you know, sl sets of slides, writing papers, whatever. I know you do some of that, but as I say, it's, it's like words like dossier. It just sounds like a big, complex project, uh, which might in itself be a little bit different to the sort of thing that you do in the more general medcoms in agency. Or am I talking rubbish there? No, not really. So global value dossiers and health technology assessment dossiers are large technical doc documents um, in, in, in fact that they convey the clinical and economic values of, of drugs. Um, so they can be quite cumbersome, particularly health technology assessments, because you're working to a set template um, where, where the body specifically um, set out a template for you to complete, essentially. And so if you're looking at a health technology assessment, you'd be looking at somewhere between 100 and 200 page document. Um, to, con to convey the benefits of a, of a, of a new drug coming to market. Um, so typically for a global value dossier, you may be looking at around 100 pages as well. Um, the global value dossier therefore actually telling the story of the clinical value. So they are, those are quite large dossiers in themselves, but you may also be working on smaller um, pieces of writing. So you may one day just work half a day on developing an outline for a poster, for example, or you may work on, um, start working on a slide deck. Um, when we talk about slide decks, we're talking about developing slide decks for use with payers um, by market, um, by, by pharm pharmaceutical reps using these slide decks to convey the benefit to payers and clinicians. And so you may be working on a smaller piece, which is a smaller slide deck um, one day. So, so I think the variety of jobs that you work on differ you, you could be working on a huge health technology assessment that's going to consume quite a bit of your time right, right. but you you generally would be allocated several projects so that you wouldn't totally be working on that health technology assessment every day every week for months on end um, my experience is that you would be allocated a number of different projects to give you vari variety um, and also as i say some technical and some not so technical work Okay. Okay. And 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 um, oh, I've lost Manka. Okay. Um, um, Amy, sorry, you back. <laughs> sorry about that. My cat sorry. burst through the door. Okay. All right. We'll let that one go. Um, um, so I was going to go to Amy. I'll skip with Amy. I mean, what Linda's just said is that resonating with what you're doing. Have you got? I mean, what sort of? Have you got a project at the moment? You could just sort of describe a little bit. You know, what you're working on. How you're working. Um, yeah. Definitely. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I think Amy first, Manka. Sorry. <laughs> Um, yes, definitely. Um, like Linda was saying, uh, is working on such a big variety of documents that um, while we do do, like you're saying, the much larger value dossiers, um, quite often on the projects that I've had experience with, they also are then accompanied by, by creating slide decks and maybe some other 
um, deliverables as well, such as literature reviews that might be accompanying it all for the same client or for the same product, but you're really kind of hitting it at all angles um, and developing multiple different um, deliverables for them that for, to be used for a range of things. Um, and they might all sort of lead into the same end product and they might be used to kind of inform the work that you're producing to be included in the Valley Dosser, for example, um, at Proof We Work with our HE team. So it might be that the models that they're developing, those outputs of those are being incorporated into the global value dossier, but it kind of gives you that crossover. And um, so the work that you do might end up influencing different things, but it does mean that you get to work in both that more technical sort of critical analytical side of things, and then pulling that forwards and working in more creative nature and how you can really like show that value in a more visual way for slides. Um, like as you say, the really long documents can be quite burdensome to read through and it's not always the quickest, most efficient way of demonstrating that data. So having that range of um, materials available for clients um, is really important. Just to pick up on a point, I think you mentioned the HE models and so on, and there's been a few mentions of models, but you're, you guys aren't modeling, are you? You've got, there are other people modeling and you're taking the results of their models and you are communicating, if you like, the results of that or the interpretation of that. Yeah, so um, that's maybe just a, worth, a point worth making. Um, Manka, again, you know, from your point of view, just, just give us a sense of, I mean, can you pick a project that you've just sort of, you're working on something, just give us a sense of what you're doing and who you're working with. Can I, can I put that yeah. in? Sure. So I think so maybe we can is a little bit different from um, from Linda and Amy's experience. But like I said, we have um, a lot of specialist agencies. So um, I get to work um, across a lot of these. So um, it could be anything from, um, you know, orphan diseases and making sure the access is there or to something more mundane like uh, pair uh, interviews or stakeholder interviews for a new uh, product. Um, so it's a very sort of varying area of um, project work that we do. Um, currently what we're working on is um, sort of a big sort of program of work um, for um, one of our sort of uh, bigger clients, uh, bigger European clients, and it's a uh, pricing and market access strategy um, for a new product in psoriasis. So um, the client is in sort of very early stages clinical trials and um, they are entering a sort of uh, field which is quite a uh, busy market, it's quite a lot of uh, drugs already on the market. So um, what they really wanted from us is to um, develop a strategy of approach, um, how, what, what kind of um, sort of value um, they want to communicate to the stakeholders and the patients, uh, how they're going to achieve that. So it's everything from thinking about what data we already have to what kind of outcomes we might want to input into phase three trials to get uh, more data or any data that we're missing so far. And then thinking about how that's going to affect um, the, the story that we tell about the drug and what positioning it might have and then obviously with the positioning also comes to pricing. So what kind of pricing differentiation um, they might be expecting. Um, so that is one big project that we've actually just started and it's going to go on for probably another year, year and a half. Um, so that's, that's sort of on the bigger, bigger end of scale. Okay, we... let's, let's, just, let's just get down to some nitty gritty. And I'm just going to, like, if I took a slide kit, I mean, you're all talking slide kits, literature reviews, da, da, da. Let's, put, let's put the big stuff to one side. Let's just take something like a slide kit. Um, I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to do is get a sense of because because people come into this business and sometimes think they're going to sort of sit at a desk and they're going to they're just going to somehow magically come up with this thing on their own and then it's going to get published or something. I don't know. I just want to try and get a sense of the fact that you're working as part of a team that as, in a slide set you've you've obviously got data that's coming in. You've got other people maybe doing the modelling and so on. Um, you're going to be putting the content together. You can always, if you like, I'm just going to talk and you nod at me, okay? But you know, you can, you can, um, you, can, you know, you put the content together. But you're going to have designers involved in this. I'm guessing you're going to have editors involved in this. You might have some uh, experts or, or or investigators or whatever uh, involved. So it, it and and ultimately the client and there's approvals and so on. I just want to get a sense of this fact that you're working as part of this you know, this, 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 whatever the word is, <laughs> group of people. So you're not just sitting in a cupboard on your own writing something, I suppose is what I'm trying to say. And you're all nodding, which is great. Has anyone got anything to add to that to make that just a yeah. little bit more come to life? Uh, your, well, I can give a little comment. bit of experience of um, <laughs> when I worked in a, uh, with, when I worked in a consultancy. So yes, typically um, you will be working with teams of people in different departments. Um, so if, so for example, if you're de developing a slide kit and that slide kit 
involves the health economic story in terms of the value messages around the cost effectiveness of the drug you would be working with a health economic health economist who has developed the model to demonstrate the cost effectiveness of that drug um, if you are looking at, um, at incorporating evidence of comparing the drug clinically with comparators in the same area then you might also be working with members of a clinical systematic review team who have looked at the clinical evidence and done, done maybe a meta-analysis to understand what the differences in the benefits are between the drugs. So yeah, you're not, as you say, just sat in a little cubby hole on your own. You're more often than not part of a wider team um, and exploring the benefits of the drug um, with other deliverables that are going on around you in order to be able to create that value story for that for that drug okay okay cool okay um and um and let's just let's just address uh, again it's an obvious point but the work you do is subject to quite a lot of critique and and, and approval and checking and you know people often talk about you know like as everybody i guess in medcoms or this sort of environment needs a bit of a thick skin because you know everything you do is going to be checked and commented on and and all the rest of it and, and that's by your colleagues i guess um and manco amy you've got colleagues in in, in house that who would be checking stuff that's before it goes to the client and the client can you know take their red pen as it were metaphorically speaking nowadays maybe um and and, and so on so mm -hmm. that, that is that an aspect you find difficult um you know uh, or can you imagine people finding difficult if they're used to doing their own work and now everything you're doing is being sort of um checked and, and sometimes uh, you know, they, they crawl all over it and they check this and they check that. Do you find that a difficult aspect of business or, or again, does that not worry you very much? Mental, very it's, it's definitely something that you have to get used to. I'd say I got used to that in my PhD. Um, <laughs> so, um, yes, obviously there's going to be uh, people internally who are reviewing. So that might be a senior writer. It might be uh, an editor, a designer. And then obviously when it goes to the client, the client team will review. And then sometimes their medical team will review their legal team might review, so you're gonna get a lot of comments. Um, so it's important to sort of have that distance from the project and be like, okay, um, obviously make sure that, you know, you're putting everything in that you're, you're writing the right things, but um, you definitely need to have that distance from, from the work and just make sure that you're not taking things personally. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Never personal, so. Yeah, and uh, coming out of an academic type of environment, um, can, you, can you give a sense of what, was it a culture change was there a sort of a wow this is a completely different environment agency environment versus academia can you give us a sense of that um it was it was it was very different um i'm, I'm not sure about um many other people's experience with with um sort of doctoral degrees but um i worked in a lab so um my work was completely self-directed um i worked on my own um and basically to my own schedule. Um, so it was a little bit of a sort of shift um, coming into working uh, nine to five with a team that, you know, you can't do some of the work until some other person does another bit of the work. So there was definitely a bit of a shift there. But I think what a PhD or even a master's prepares you very well for is medical writing and sort of that sort of scientific method that's um, sort of crucial to everything that we do. Uh, Amy, have you got any comment on that? You, you've got a, a variety of backgrounds behind you. What was the agency environment like when you came in? Was it very, was it what you expected or very different? Yeah, I think, I think it's fair to say it was what I expected, but you, it's definitely something that takes getting used to. I mean, um, I actually didn't do a PhD, so I was just BSc, but um, my final year project, I did a lot of science communication projects. So although majority of the writing content was just individual, you did spend a lot of time um, doing other sort of science communication activities with that team but um, yeah it's definitely when you first start because you are most of the time working on several different projects and alongside the project team the whole time it is definitely a bit of a learning curve but um, I do think the way the, the way it's structured at Prove um, especially the way that you're kind of working with the project team the whole way through so they are small teams and you're working with um, people all the way up to a much senior level so you kind of have that input throughout anyway and um, so when you kind of get those comments to address it might be stuff that you're already familiar with and you kind of have that input throughout your writing it's not just being sort of torn apart at the end um, but yeah you, you kind of get used to it and, and those naturally those inputs kind of naturally happen anyway as you develop um, <laughs> compared to when you first start. Okay and it's worth it's worth saying you've got that that group of people that you're working with so you're not just on your own 
you've got to you've got to be part of it you've got to be a team player you've got to so on. but it's also worth making a point very clearly that you're not just left to hang out to dry because you've got that support around you and people you know at all levels are supporting and managing and, um, and, and and training and so on and so forth so it's a very supportive environment or at least that's what people tend to say about it um, again maybe more with with Mankra and Amy for a second but someone's asked what sort of training do you get regarding the technical side of things so can you just Mankra I'll start with you um, just give us a bit of a flavour of is it on the job you've, you've talked a little bit about your um, training program at um, Amicula but is it very on the job or is there formalised training is it external training um, so we have um, at Amicula we have um, an online platform learning platform called curriculum um, and that's where we have a lot of the sort of first couple of weeks training modules and um, so they're anything from how to write better um, sort of tips and tricks to what's the pharmaceutical industry like, what kind of market access exists in different countries. So it goes from the broad to the very specific, depending on um, what company, what, what, what agency you work with. Obviously, for a market access um, writer, you will want to know about market access, whether if you're some, another kind of writer, you might not need to know that. Um, so we have a lot of um, work that goes on into that sort of curriculum learning platform. Um, I would say the other part of it is uh, primarily on the job learning. Um, so with our trainee writers, um, we always put them on projects with at least one other experienced writer and they're sort of their mentor. Um, so just making sure that, you know, they're never sort of left to do things on their own. They always have someone to talk to um, and we always sort of make sure that we do a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with them um, because it is market access is one of those things that I think a lot of people sort of drop in from a medcoms background um, so there's almost not an expectation that you should know things um, when you start unless of course you're starting at a director level or something like that okay okay uh, Amy have you got any comments on that um, no, definitely. I think it's it's easy to think that you're not really aware of the, like you say, market access or more of that technical side of things when you start. Um, Adelphi had two really good sort of streams of training. As you come in as a graduate, you've got your graduate academy um, training, which really gets you familiar with market access and the pharmaceutical industry as a whole and that more commercial side that you're unlikely really to have covered at university, especially if you're doing sort of life science clinical studies. Um, and then you've got your training, which is more sort of based on the type of deliverables and the type of work that we produce. Um, it might be really specific things just to kind of get you familiar with, say, health economics that you might not be personally working on, but it's good to have that sort of background and ability to obviously analyze that data and systematic literature reviews and the processes that go behind those, which we're obviously involved in, in developing. Um, to, you kind of got those training sessions running alongside but i think the the biggest training you get is yeah like Manko was saying just on the job training getting involved in projects pretty much from the your first sort of weeks in the business and um, and obviously you just develop those as you go along and it might be that you're unfamiliar with certain projects that you've not had the ability to kind of partake in so far but that training sort of just comes as and when you need it and um, okay. and it's always available if you need to ask senior team team members for okay. help and advice on particular things okay so, so I, I suppose out of this comes an obvious question, Linda. You know, you don't have to be a health economist, economics specialist um, yeah. to begin with, sort of thing. Yeah, no. that's not that's not what they're looking for. No, it's not. I think I think if you've got a basic understanding though of health economics prior to going into the interview, that would be really helpful. If you're going into a, an agency that deals with health economics, and you can you can grasp a lot of that um, already through the guide. Um, but also just by Googling online and getting some basic understanding of health economics. And that would help you definitely at interview to show that you've um, reached out to, to try and uh, understand that um, particular area and also with market access as well. And my experience is that actually you do get trained pretty much on the job, um, both with internal courses, um, but also maybe some short external courses, and maybe a couple of days uh, how to become a medical writer of course for a couple of days and then a couple of days of it on an external health economic basic introduction to health economic course so um, it depends on which agency you, you go to work for but yeah both on the job and, and external i would say is probably okay that makes sense and hopefully hopefully the guide that you've written with us is um, is a great starting point and gives people some useful background there so go and find out at first my comes job 
Um, can I just, I, I'd like to sort of wrap up the recording part of this. Um, I've got one eye on the time, on the time here. Um, could I just ask you, I, 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 hopefully I've um, set you up slightly for this. So um, um, if we can just wrap up, maybe if there was just one tip to, to offer to somebody who's thinking about coming into, into specific, specifically HUR market access lighting, um, I'm going to start with Manka. Have you got a tip for somebody? Um, yes, I do. Um, so uh, we are um, currently recruiting for um, for writers um, at Miculum, and um, the thing that we're looking for um, most of all um, is a good uh, demonstration of writing skills. So um, even if you are not uh, a PhD a qualified uh, writer, um, you still can apply don't feel like you need to have um a high tech level degree for that um but you need to be demonstrating that writing skills or you need to be telling us about it because if you don't tell us about it we're going to scan for your your cv and be like oh well this person doesn't have any market access skills nor do they have any writing skills so we're going to move on so make sure that you are pointing that out because that is one of the biggest asks when you're starting Okay, so it sort of sounds obvious, but you need to think about that, yeah? Um, yeah, I think, I think that's the biggest thing in a lot of um, CVs that we see, especially when people start uh, straight from uni, and um, they don't spend enough time telling us what their writing skills are, because I think when you're looking at CVs, you always want to be interviewing them, you always want to get them to the next stage, but you need to be the one to tell us that we should be doing that. To okay. You. Okay. And that will come over quite quickly in a letter of application or... In yeah. the CV, if they're spelling things right, or if they're getting the sentence right. I mean, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's sort, of, it's sort of obvious stuff, but you need to think about this stuff. Yeah, if you're applying mm -hmm. to be a writer. Amy, Amy, have you got a tip for anyone who wants to come into this business? Um, yes, definitely. So, on top of the obviously writing skills sort of assessment that's um, quite often included in interview process and um, for jobs in this sort of role, um, I think it's important just to, to really highlight your your interest in the area as well. I mean, like we were saying before. It's unlikely that you're going to be really familiar with that, but really highlighting that you've got that willingness to learn and that willingness to learn not just about market access, but the constantly sort of changing sort of scientific nature and you're bringing that forward from your degree. So, so in interviews and things like that, just make sure that you're, you know, you're flagging that you're sort of passionate about science and about writing. Um, and I think that will really come across um, as a positive and that you're sort of, yeah, <laughs> looking to develop those skills. Okay, great. Linda, have you got a, a, a final tip to throw out there? I think um, alongside the CV, I would think very carefully about constructing the cover letter, because I think um, the cover letter actually explains why you want the role, and why you're excited about joining the company and why you want to become, um, in the first instance, if it's a, a trainee role, trainee medical writer in market access and health economics. So going back to what I said previously about maybe doing a bit of research prior to applying for these kind of jobs in terms of market access and health economics to get a real understanding of that. Maybe talking to some writers in, in agencies, different kinds of agencies to understand more around what they do so that you go into the interview and the cover letter with that knowledge and that comes across, first of all, in the cover letter, but secondly, if you get an interview during the interview process. Excellent. Okay, look, um, on that note, um, because of course, obviously we provide lots of information at First Medcom's job, let's just remind everybody if they want to come and find out more um, and read your guide, Linda, and so on. Um, but can I just wrap this up by saying a huge thank you to the three of you um, and make the point to everybody that you're all happy if people reach out to you via LinkedIn. Um, you're, you're, you're happy to hear from people, so that's a good, good way of making some contact. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I'm going to wrap up the video recording. Those of you online at the moment, um, please do um, stick around. That's fine, because uh, we'll carry on to the top of the hour. And there's still there's a, there's a few good questions here that we'll, we'll talk about specifically in the next 10 minutes or so. So thank you very much. And everybody, if we can just say bye-bye and give a bit of a wave, I'll, um, I'll stop the recording. So bye-bye. Thanks very much. Bye.